Hi, I'm Howlin' Bickerstaff, and I'm on Musicians on the Record. So, here we go. On the record, bring it on! Now I can see afternoon sunlight Looking through my window screen Cloudy blue skies above birds in flight Everything so fresh and green But when I get back to the city All the women are so pretty But before I even get a chance to say hello I find myself back in the country Back in the country Now we came up north to play music Haven't played a single note Filling our days with excuses Wasting our time with the things we wrote before Now there ain't no use crying and complaining We're the ones who said we had so much to learn But we ain't learned one damn thing Don't you think it's time we got down to music? Now bitching about it won't change it There is but one thing to say You gotta take the time to rearrange it Make it through another day Yeah, cause we've been doing nothing But sitting in our rooms Smoking funny cigarettes and staring at the walls Don't you think it's time? Don't you think it's time? Yeah, don't you think it's time? Don't you think it's time? Yeah, don't you think it's time? Hi, welcome to Musicians on the Record. I'm David Ward. This is the show where we get the musician's story, and I am so grateful on the show today Maine's own Howland Bickerstaff is on the show. Howland, welcome. Howdy, thank you. So great to have you Good here. Good to be here. Absolutely. I'm excited. I'm excited too. I'm pumped! So, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So you're an amazing guitarist for The Substitutes and Misspent Youth. We're going to get into a lot of your history around stuff and, uh, you know, introduce these beautiful instruments. Let's just start with when did you fall in love with music and the guitar? Wow, long time ago. My mom was a classically trained pianist. Um, and so I grew up with all the old French Impressionist stuff like Debussy and Eric Satie. And she was good at some Rachmaninoff and some other things. And so um, we would hear piano every other day, you know, when we were younger or sometimes every other week, depending upon how busy mom was. Yeah. Um, Dad was a sterling bass and sang in the church choir and um, I got a great appreciation for music back then because back in that day, um, well, let's call it the 50s, shall we? Let's, yeah, because sure. that's when it was. Okay. Um, that was when there were all sorts of, there was all sorts of pop music going on like Patti Page and Jimmy Rogers and Tony Bennett and you know Frank Sinatra and and all these other incredible vocalists with great band arrangements and what have you 
Um, and then there was pop, you know, like uh, Jimmy Rogers. Uh oh, I'm falling in love again. Uh oh, uh oh, you know that kind of stuff. Yeah. And Perry Como, you know, catch a falling star and yes. put yes. it in your pocket. Yeah. You know, and and a lot of those and Doris Day and mm. so I was growing up with that pop music. Yeah. And also listening to symphonic music, and my dad was well. The best way to put it is, I think, my dad was into the heavy metal composers. Oh, is that right? I'm talking about the Russians. Oh, okay. So <laughs> Mussorgsky and Stravinsky, wow. and so we would be listening to, you know, pictures at an exhibition, Night on Bald Mountain, or uh -huh. Firebird Suite, and you know, hearing all the banging and crashing that was going on in those particular. So I got into heavy metal classical, uh, <laughs> and really enjoyed that. Actually went to Philadelphia Philadelphia Symphony Orchestra. Mm. Uh, my mom was really good with that in terms of getting us exposed to music. With Eugene Ormandy, who was the conductor of the Philadelphia Symphony at mm. the time, um, got to see Danny Kay. Actually, who couldn't read a note of music, but wow. he conducted an entire movement of a symphony, That's and we amazing. were all laughing our butts off listening to that yeah. wow. and having a great time. Huh. And uh, Victor Borga and some of those other wow. folks. So I got well exposed to good classical music. And then, of course, along with the pop stuff, in came the folk era. Mm -hmm. So Kingston Trio, Peter, yeah. Paul, and Mary, yes. a lot of those other folks. And then, um, and then, of course, in came rock and roll. <laughs> 55, right? Chuck Berry, yeah. Elvis Presley, yeah. Carl Perkins, yeah. and then came R&B. Right which of course is, you know, the Detroit stuff and Motown. I, I just got, again, another vinyl copy of The Temptations Greatest Hits, mm. that blue album with the silver graphics on it. I mean, I mean, that opens up with, I know you want to leave me, but I refuse. So anyway, so I was exposed to that um, and went to local dances with, uh, you know, local DJs of the radio stations and things like that. And, and was this in Philly or where did you in grow Philly. up? In Philly. I was actually, I was actually on American Bandstand as an audience member. Is that right? Twice. Wow. I was not asked to review, you know, it's 98, it's got a good beat. I was not asked any of that, but I was actually able to be on the show. Wow. And, um... Jackie Wilson mm. was on there, and yeah. I think the other one was Little Anthony and the Imperials, if wow, I'm... Wow. So anyway, uh, it was just uh, just a, a great exposure to be, you know, to be, some, you know, in the middle of all of that going yeah. on, yeah. as it was just coming to life. Sure, absolutely. Sounds very rich. Oh, yeah. yeah. And yeah. so for you, how old were you when either you either picked up a first guitar or did you play piano as well? I first was taught piano, um, there's a little booklet underneath a piano bench cushion called John Thompson's Teaching Little Fingers to Play. Okay. Uh, and I got started with that because my brother and I were both taking piano lessons from the local church organ okay. at Wayne Presbyterian Church in the Philadelphia area. And um, my brother quit, so I wanted to be cool like him and quit. Okay. Because, <laughs> you know, you copy your older sure, brother. That's right. And uh, we were about a year and a half apart. <laughs> And so he quit, so I quit. But then I got interested in guitar at about age seven. Mm. And so my parents said, well, okay, we know how that goes. Right. You're interested, then you're not. Right, right. So they went to Sears and bought me a cheap plywood Harmony arch top guitar um, for $35. It's mm. the kind that had the binding painted on it, uh -huh. you know, with stripes. <laughs> and literally was made out of plywood. I saw one of those at the local music store, Buck Dancer's Choice here in Portland, last year. And it was going for $350. Wow. <laughs> just for its antique and vintage yes. value. Um, but it was difficult to play. Mm. But my parents said, if you stick with that, you know, for a year, mm. then we'll buy you a better guitar. Wow. And so I did. Okay. I took lessons from a woman named Miss Gross, okay. taking the Carcassi method of guitar. And I mean, there's still some of those like, it's like, <laughs> so you do all those little exercises like sure. that. So you're learning to, just get the basics of guitar. And, um, and after a while, I quit doing that because mm. I think my parents were having trouble affording the lessons anyway. Okay. And I just got more and more into listening to things like Kingston Trio mm. and, and others and just figuring them out by ear. Yeah. 
Yeah. So a lot, some lessons, but a lot of it self-taught. Oh yeah. As yeah. a matter of fact, I would say most of it self-taught. Most of it self-taught. So yeah. Mrs. Gross was there for a little bit, but you took it from there. Yeah. 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 Were there any other important teachers that came along, whether whether personally, professionally? Well, only within school. Uh, I had a, an advisor named Anthony Ridgway who said, you know, you can do whatever you set your mind to. Mm. He was uh, in charge of the library and uh, was an advisor for a lot of students. Really great guy. Mm. Also, there was a music teacher named Curtis York mm. who was... Back in the day, I mean, this guy was rather flamboyant. He had a pompadour haircut. He drove a pink 59 Chevy convertible. <laughs> and, uh, but what a great guy. Um, he would expose us to all kinds of different music. And he was also the director of our glee clubs and choruses. And, mm. and I sang from probably the age of seven or eight on. Mm. So mm. I was taught to sing very early. Okay. I sang in church choirs and, yeah. and other things. So... But Curtis York was the guy that just got me continually, I mean, just said, look, keep going with it. Whatever you're doing, keep going with it. So, so inspiring, motivating. Thank you, Curtis York. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Great. And so you get into grade school, middle school, high school. Where did, you, where did music go for you at that time? Where did you want it to go to? Well, I think one of the first bands that I got into was doing a sort of Kingston Trio stuff, just okay. doing folk song yeah. stuff. Um, like, uh, scotch and soda on your eye, baby, do I feel high on me, oh my, do I feel high? So that, you know, yeah. <laughs> that kind of stuff, um, you know, or if, if I had a hammer, I'd hammer the door, you know, great. all that, so. Absolutely. Getting into all the folky stuff, mm. um, but then uh, I gotta say, Beatles, mm. sixty-four, Ed Sullivan, <laughs> nineteen sixty-four, right? yeah. Ed Sullivan, yeah. Yeah. pow, right? You know, right. I just got Ron Howard's movie on uh, the Beatles, the live Beatles stuff. Yeah, how did you like it? I loved it. Mm. I loved yeah. it. Yeah. And it just talked about that phenomenon. And I was glad that they had Malcolm Gladwell in there, mm. talking about towards the end on the disc two about how the whole reason that the Beatles were as good as they were and the things happened the way they happened was that they had already spent 10,000 hours right. doing right. their craft. Yeah. So they were already experts. Sure. Yeah. And so it was no accident, right. you know, in that regard yeah. to be able to, because they were just a tight-knit unit. Imagine playing eight hours a day. Right. Right. You know, Absolutely. that you're forced in a band to, you know, if you want to make money, yes. you got to play eight hours a day. Wow. Yeah. You know, right. in Hamburg. Right, right. right. You know, and then finally, after you've done the Hamburg stuff, to yeah. finally come back to Liverpool yeah. and then play in the cavern because everybody's going, oh, you should hear the Beatles. Right. You right. know, before that, before they left for Hamburg, right. nobody was interested. They That's right. Care. That's right. But that was more time spent yeah. honing the craft. Right. And so yeah. I liked that Gladwell came into that picture and yeah. talked about how much time you've put in. Mm. And I've put in probably well over 10,000 hours. Yes, no question, no question. Into right. my craft. Sure, so. yeah, and it shows, right? You well, can, thank you. You can hear it, right? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so many people have told me about that that moment in time, the Beatles on Ed Sullivan just really inspired them to become musicians. What did, what did that moment mean to you, and where did you take music from there? Well, right there was, I was in a band, a um, <laughs> little humorous story here. Yeah. Uh, we were in a folk band, five of us, called mm -hmm. the Ten Shoes. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> and great. one of the people in the band quit, so we called ourselves the Eight Balls. <laughs> <laughs> but our, our teachers and advisors didn't like that uh -huh. because yeah. it was too suggestive. Yeah. So they made us change the name, and we became the Hustlers. Mm -hmm. And we actually put out, there's a guy named John Harrison, um, who I was playing with, who was in that band. And John wrote a couple of songs... And we actually did a single. Now, John Harrison is the same John Harrison who wrote the screenplay for the second version, the made-for-TV version of Dune. Oh. So, yeah. um, remarkable guy. Yeah. And uh, we had a lot of fun. So we did this song. I think it was, um, there was a song called You Don't Want That. Mm -hmm. And there was another song. I can't remember the flip side of it. But it became what's called a turntable hit. Okay. Where in Pittsburgh... Um, 
it was a hit. People requested it, but there were no major sales. So, but it was just a forty-five single. Yeah. And DC, it became a turntable hit. Wow! So, uh, very nice to have. And that was right around the time that Beatles sixty-five came out. Mm -hmm. And um, the she's a woman, and I and I feel fine. Yeah. Were the two singles. And wow. our radio station locally in Pittsburgh, KQV, was the one who quote had the exclusive. But I'm sure that had every other radio station right. in the country was going, we have the exclusive right. exactly. release first at our station. Right. You know, but, you know, we it was really cool to listen to that. Yeah. yeah. So we were off and running at yeah. that point, doing Beatles covers, doing Stones covers, nice. you know, doing all of that. Got right. to see the Stones at the Civic Arena in Pittsburgh, got to watch Mick Jagger get electrocuted and pass out because oh. the grounding was not right on the PA system. Yikes. Yeah. So, but... Uh, and got to see, I had a girlfriend who lived in D.C. by the time I got to college, uh, and we went down and saw The Temptations in Maryland. Um, so, getting exposed. Yeah. Getting yeah. exposed. For you then, what was the dream? What was that musical dream where you wanted to go? Well, I also got into acting. Hmm. And so, uh, did some theater and musical stuff in high school, and then got into Carnegie Mellon. Oh, wow. Um, and there's a few people that I, I could drop some names yeah, okay. about people that I went to school with okay. um, who became famous. Mm. Um, and a, a lot of my classmates of that particular era like did Godspell mm. and left to go to Broadway and do, and do that. Mm. So, but somewhere along the line, um, I was, quote, advised to withdraw, unquote. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and that was because my acting teacher didn't particularly care for me, and my the head of the department wouldn't support me in staying mm. there. So mm. I moved to Boston and went to Boston University for a semester ah, cool. and a summer session. But somewhere along the way, I was jamming with some musicians. Aha. <laughs> and so the road forked. Music came back. Right. And it was, we want you to join our band. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's when... We got into a band called Greenhouse, and Greenhouse got managed by a company called Lordly and Dame, and we started going around doing warm-up stuff. Mm. That's when we warmed up for Paul Butterfield yeah. at Southern Massachusetts University. Wow. That's yeah. where we got to do some gigs around New England mm. and, and um, started developing a little bit of a name. Yeah. Tell us about those, some of those highlights for you. Well, that warming up at Southern Massachusetts University for Paul Butterfield, that was yeah. back in the day. Mike Bloomfield was still alive. Yeah. Um, and wow, what a band! Yeah, what a band. East West was the album mm. I think that came out during mm -hmm. that time, mm -hmm. and uh, mm. just amazing to hear those guys. Yeah, just amazing. Um, and there was a, <laughs> um, and that band I think lasted through until about mm. 1973. Mm. But there's one of those songs uh, I'm going to cover mm -hmm. here at this. <laughs> is by a guy, the bass player in, in Greenhouse, named Jamie Michaels. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jamie has since gone on to become a folkie. Mm. So this is a very appropriate song. All right. Um, and sort of a country flavor. It was back in the summer of 71. This is his song, by the way. <laughs> Me and the boys in the band. We picked up our guitars and with stars in our eyes. Went up to the country to live on the land. It was grand. You see, now this is his take on the song that I played earlier. Yeah. So, now we was all city boys and we didn't know that living in the country ain't fun. There's bats in the attic and bugs in the bed. The toilets don't work and nobody comes to the gigs. Oh, the bartender's sleeping and the waitress is bored. There's nary a patron inside. So let's have a hand for the boys in the band. They're the only ones drinking tonight. Now I'm a folk singer and I'm singing folk songs. I never liked rock anyway. That's Jamie, not me. Right, right. <laughs> but if we stayed in the city where our music belongs, we'd probably be bigger than the Beatles today, or the Stones, or the Who. Well, who cares? <laughs> oh, the bartender's sleeping and the waitress is bored. 
He's nary a patron in sight. So let's have a hand for the boys in the band. They're the only ones drinking tonight. And they have to pay. <laughs> Very nice. That's <laughs> awesome. That's great. So that was Jamie's take on what happened in New Hampshire when we went up to write songs. <laughs> so Nice. And we were playing gigs to nobody. So I really liked... You know, that parallel when Robbie Robertson was talking about playing in that club in Dallas with the band, and mm. they were playing to, there were two people in the club besides the bartender and the waitress, and a fight broke out. <laughs> <laughs> so this is my little 1954 Fender Champ lap steel, and how I know that is that inside this little cavity here, there's a um, piece of masking tape in pencil and the assemblers would write down their first name and the date of assembly and this one inside says in pencil Mary 210 1954 so and it's made out of swamp ash because you can tell with this wearing off the grain and there's an old what they call a single coil broadcaster pickup in there and it just just tone personified yeah, so yeah. so that's my lap steel Sounds so that's one of the tools that I use, and I do some tunes with both the Substitutes and Misspent Youth, mm. and also do some gigs occasionally on the side in the greater Portland area with some other folks in some other bands, such as um, Phil and the Extraordinary Human Beings, yeah. Phil Davinsky and yeah. other folks like that. And um, Actually, we played Frog and Turtle a couple months ago and did a uh, John Hyatt tune called Feels Like Rain. Yeah. And we got a standing O at the end Beautiful. and it was just... <sighs> Buddy Guy plays that as well, right? Yes, yeah. Buddy Guy plays it. And as a matter of fact, I met John Hyatt last fall when they were doing a recovery um, gig, a gig to benefit a recovery center called Club 202 mm. in Nashville. And we had a conversation for about an hour. Wow. And I told him... <laughs> John, one of these years, I want to play lap steel on Feels Like Rain yeah. with you. Because <laughs> right. I think I do it pretty well. Yeah. But anyway. <laughs> so, and this is my 1988 Fender Telecaster that I use quite a lot on most of my gigs. Mm. It's a custom setup. Um, and it actually has a, uh, something called a B-Bender in it. Um, installed by Joe Glazer of Nashville. Mm. And what that literally does is, if you push down on the strap... You can put a so you can put some really nice licks on it. So this I use because it's quite versatile. You can get a whole bunch of different tones out of it. So beautiful guitar. That's yeah, I love this guitar. Mm. And then of course there's the acoustic. Yes. And um, Keith Richards says, <laughs> if you're not touching wood once a day, you're out of touch. <laughs> <laughs> And I tend to agree with him. Yeah, we got to um, follow what Keith says, for yeah. God's sakes, right? Well, because Keith's been around a long time. Yeah, he has. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but this is this is my baby, and um, beautiful. This is an Eastwood, which is kind of a takeoff on a Gibson J45 or J50. Um, put a little less money. Yeah. 